your practice doesn't come together simply because causes and conditions happen to be that way. There's something inside you that has to want it to happen and to make it happen. You look at the images the Buddha gives for people who do the practice, people who are searching for something, people who are struggling, fighting in battles, people who are being trained in skills. It requires an element of will. The term for will in Pali is atitana, determination. And there are four determinations that are really good for the practice. It's good to keep them in mind. The first, the Buddha says, is not to neglect discernment. What does it mean to neglect discernment? It implies that you have some discernment already, but you're not paying attention to it. You remember the basic principle of discernment is you look at your actions and see which of your actions lead to long-term welfare and happiness and which ones lead in another direction. And then not to, delect, not to neglect discernment means that you actually work on the ones that lead to long-term happiness. That's why the Buddha said one of the measures of your discernment is when you see there's something you don't like to do, but you know it's going to give good results, happiness in the long run. You're able to talk yourself into wanting to do it. You're not just forcing yourself. You're giving yourself reasons. You see why it would be a good thing to be more generous, to be more virtuous, to meditate more, realizing that these things really are for your benefit. All the aspects of the training are there for your benefit. This is probably why that Zen master said that the great way is not difficult for those with no preferences. Now, he's not saying that you don't prefer the end of suffering to suffering. You do prefer the end of suffering. It's simply that you look at what's required to put it into suffering, and there are some things that will be difficult, but you don't let your preferences get in the way. You're willing to do whatever is needed to be done. This is in line with that one of the meanings of the principle of practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. We're not here to change the Dharma, or to update it. The Dharma is timeless. That's what we chant every, almost every day, Akali Ko. There's nothing in the Dharma that needs to be changed. What needs to be changed is in us. And so when you're willing to make those changes, that's what it means to not neglect discernment. The second determination is to guard the truth. Now, this has a particular meaning in the Pali Canon. It says you're very careful to be alert to where you get your knowledge. When you have a certain opinion, where did it come from? And why are you holding to it? When you're careful about this, you realize how little you really know. And when you're taking, taking on the path, how much you have to take on conviction. So that also means if you are operating on conviction, what can you do to confirm it? You may like something because it seems reasonable. The Buddha said that's not reason enough for it to actually be true. A while back I was getting emails from someone who said that because the commentaries come from an unbroken tradition, we have to accept them. Well, as the Buddha himself said, just because something comes from an unbroken tradition doesn't mean it's true. It can fit in with your ideas about what you think you already know. That's not proof that it's already true. This reminds you that you're going to have to test things, because what is the Buddha's proof? You actually take on a teaching, you put it into practice. And you see what results you get. If something leads you to act in ways that lead to long-term welfare and happiness in line with discernment, because then you know you've got something true. 
if they lead to long-term harm and suffering, okay, the teaching is false. So you have to put things to the test if you want to guard the truth. That means putting yourself to the test as well, because your powers of judgment can be skewed. I know a large number of people who say, well, I've tried mindfulness practice and it doesn't really do much for me, so there must be nothing there. Well, exactly how much did they do it? How committed were they to it? How did they guard the truthfulness of their own actions? That's the big question right there. So when you're going to test the Buddhist teachings, you're going to be testing yourself. It's going to make demands in terms of how much mindfulness you develop, how much alertness you develop, and how much ardency. When John Lee discusses those three characteristics, those three qualities that you bring to mindfulness practice, when it comes to the, which of them embodies discernment, he says it's the ardency. Again, this would be another meaning for not neglecting discernment, that you're really ardent in testing things, and really ardent in testing yourself, so you really come to the truth. I mean, look at the Buddha, all that he went through in order to find the truth. And even when he gained awakening, he tested it from various angles. And what would really constitute a real awakening? It was only when he found that no matter which angle you looked at it from, it constituted a genuine awakening, genuine freedom. Only then did he teach. So he guarded the truth, one inside, by being clear about where he was basing his knowledge, and then doing what he could to develop his mind in such a way that he could actually see from his own experience what was true and what was not, particularly with regard to the issue of putting an end to suffering. The third determination is to be devoted to relinquishment. Now, the word for relinquishment, jaga in Pali, can mean anything from giving a gift to giving up your defilements. You're learning how to let go from, from the very beginning. And you let go in deeper and deeper ways. That's how you're devoted to it, or committed to it. Now, there's sometimes when we let go because we know we should let go, but there'll be part of the mind that will take it back. As one of my John Lee's students once said, it's like holding something in your hand and then putting it down, but leaving your hand on top of it. So you can pick it up whenever you want to again. That's how most of us let go. But as the Buddha said, you have to really understand things if you're going to let them go properly. And he gives five steps. There's something in the mind that you know is unskillful. Watch it. See when it comes. And look for what the Buddha calls its origination. Now, when he uses the word origination, it means two things. One, you're looking for the cause. Not simply for the fact that it arises, but what's causing it to arise, what arises together with it. And secondly, nine times out of ten when the Buddha talks about origination, it's causes coming from within the mind. What inside the mind is sparking this? How long does it last? Because that's the next step you want to see, is when it passes away. And when you see that the origination or the cause passes away, and then this particular defilement passes away, then you really see, okay, there's a connection. So what it is about the, the cause that attracts you, that's the third step, is what's the allure? Where is that particular desire focused? As the Buddha notes, the desire can be focused in almost anything. You think you desire a person. Oftentimes it's not the person you desire, you desire a certain perception around the person, or you desire a certain status. It's like that old commercial about the, the BMW chill, the guy who comes up in a parking garage, he's up on the top of the parking garage, steps out the door of the elevator, sees his BMW in the midst of all these other old jalopsies, and he just shivers because it's his BMW. 
Okay, the status there is what where the allure lies. It's not in the car itself. It's in what it means, what it says about you. That's what they're trying to say. This is how a lot of advertising works. Well, your mind does that to you, too. And you have to see exactly where is the allure, because often it can be hidden, especially if it's something you're not especially proud of. So you have to dig down. What is it that you like about that particular defilement? And then you compare it in the fourth step with the drawbacks. If you go for that particular defilement, what's going to happen? And you're, again, you bring in your discernment. This is where the teachings on the three perceptions come in. That whatever pleasure you get out of this, it's going to be inconstant, stressful, not self, i.e. It's not worth holding on to as your own. That teaching on that self is really a value judgment, meant to lead to a deeper value judgment, so that you can say, this is really not worth it. And you get to that fifth stage in letting go, which is developing dispassion for what you used to have passion for. And that's the escape. So that's how you're devoted to relinquishment. You don't just let go because you're supposed to. You let go because you see there's really no good reason to hold on. And you have to let go at the right time. There's certain things in the path that you have to hold on to to get you across the river. Think of that raft that takes you across the river. If you let go in the middle of the river, you drown. You will hold on to the raft until it's taking you across. Then you let go. In other words, the path has to do its work, and you have to do the work of the path in order to really understand why something is really worth letting go. That's being devoted to relinquishment. And finally, the fourth determination is to train only for calm. And of course, the whole path here is a training. Virtue. A heightened virtue, heightened mind, heightened discernment. It's all for the calm of Nibbana. So even in the factors for awakening, when some of the factors for awakening are energizing, you energize the body first, you energize the mind first. Because if you go start out saying, I'm just going to calm things down, sometimes you put yourself to sleep. So you learn how to energize yourself by the way you breathe, by the way you think. Then you calm things down. This is why in the breath meditation instructions you're calming bodily fabrication, even to the point where the breath stops. You're calming mental fabrication, even to the point where perceptions and feelings stop. That's the direction we're headed. Now, you don't just suppress these things. You have to calm things down through understanding. In other words, you're practicing calm and insight together. And that's when the calm is genuine. So those are the four determinations. Not neglecting discernment, guarding the truth, being devoted to relinquishment, and training only for calm. It's these determinations that keep you on track. Because after all, the, the path has to come out of desire. And the problem with the desire is that there's not just one desire in your mind. There are many desires. And as we get on the path, what makes it a path is the fact that we clear the way. So this is going to be the desire that takes over. This is going to be the, the master desire. And you do that through determination. So your determination for the discernment, truth, relinquishment, calm. You want those to have priority over whatever desires may come sloshing up around, in, around them in your mind. That's when you're doing concentration practice. It's not the case that you just sit here and wait for concentration to come, or hope that concentration will come. Somehow your past karma will act. As the Buddha said, it's what you experience right now is the result of past karma together with present karma. 
And it's the present karma that makes it possible for you to experience it at all. Which means, on the one hand, you can manipulate things right now. But also, if you learn how to calm things down here in the present moment, it can open up to something that's not caused. And that's, that's the calm we're aiming at. That's the, the truth and the relinquishment we're aiming at through our discernment. So keep this point uppermost in mind. The path isn't going to happen on its own. You have to make it happen. And you have to overcome a lot of other desires that go in other directions. Give the desire for the path top priority. And that's when you're practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. It's all for the sake of disenchantment, the insight that sees that the other things you've been going for are really not worth it. You've had enough. In the words of the Forester Johns, you've grown up, you've gotten, gotten sober after having been intoxicated. And you get there. You grow up by using your discernment and being true and letting go and training only for calm. Give those determinations top priority and see how far they can take you.